Welcome to another episode of uh, Silver Lining for Learning. And uh, we have the, the six hosts of us. We have uh, Chris Didi from Harvard, Shuang Ye Chen from East China Normal University, Kurt Bunk from Indiana, Punya Mishra from uh, Arizona State University, and Scott McLeod from University of Colorado. And I'm Yong Zhao from uh, University of Kansas and Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Today, as we're seeing a lot of new hopes for vaccine and also disappointing news about vaccine, and we're still in the COVID pandemic and the, the impact has truly become generational. And uh, after so many episodes, uh, we are here to reflect again, to think about what have we learned, what we would like to learn more. And we are a group of people who are just interested in topic and uh, we've been running this uh, ourselves. I can't believe how long we've been running this. So today, we, I, I, my interest has been, is it, are there are a few things that you have learned or you think people should take and should think about because we are seeing massive changes in education. We're seeing paths, pandemic paths. We're seeing parents rising to take charge more of their education. And this is, uh, it is seems to be changing a lot, but it also seems to be nothing is changing. So uh, let's go. I, I'm going to just call on, on your name because you know it's easier for me to do that where so you don't have to fight. And let me start with Scott. Scott McLeod, um, what do you think out of so many episodes, what do you think there are a couple of things that we we should tell people this is a good idea, go do it. Uh I think the first takeaway is that um, we have lots of innovators out there um, across systems, outside of systems, within systems, whatever, but we're very bad at scaling. Um, so even if you have a subset of innovative teachers and leaders and coaches and you know technology people within your school district, that doesn't mean that your system is very good at getting those ideas across the system, right? So that they infect and um, take hold with others. And so as we think about pandemic era education, even during remote learning, we have people doing some really interesting stuff with their kids from a distance. Um, and I wonder how well school systems are ramping up to get that knowledge out to others so that it doesn't become yet another equity issue. In other words, hey, Kurt, you're really lucky to have this robust remote learning experience, uh, but because you don't have Punya as a teacher, I'm sorry, because you have Punya as a teacher, you're in good luck, right? But because you have uh, Chris as a teacher, if somebody else has Chris as a teacher, then they're out of luck, right? Like we have this equity concern. And it's the same concern that we used to talk about when we talked about guaranteeing viable curriculum, is that how do we make sure that every student has a high quality learning experience um, whether it's face-to-face, -face, remote, blended, or whatever. And we have these innovators that are out there showing us the way, and we've had them for four decades, and we still continue to be poor at learning from them. So that's the idea I'll put on the table to start. Thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks, Scott. I think uh, what, what's important, I think you, you've highlighted is equity, but also you've really highlighted another important thing that is there are many innovators. And it's more important that you highlighted that uh, the innovators have existed for a long time. They've been there for a long, long time. How do we get more? How do we get more people to become innovators? How do we get everybody to become innovators? That's going to be challenging. And uh, moving away uh, from Scott to uh, Punia. Punia, what, so, what are you? Um, I wanted to uh, actually follow up on something Scott said and sort of something that you said as well, that yes, we have a lot of innovators. And the reason I feel like the change doesn't scale or sustain uh, is because we are not tackling, I think, the systemic sort of issues. I think that individuals can make so much impact on an existing system, but systems have a way of, if you are just, you know, um, it's a system playing whack-a-mole with, uh, whack with uh, innovators, right? Uh, somebody tries something like, okay, we'll let you do your little thing, and then we'll 
push you down and the system goes on. And I think that that's been a fundamental issue with education in general and innovation in general in this space is that we haven't been able to figure out how some of these systemic problems can be changed. So I'll give, to take one example, that would be assessment, right? And I think there are certain positives that are emerging, which is, you know, a lot of districts have or, you know, said like, okay, we won't do the standardized test or universities saying we won't accept ACTs or SATs. And, and, and so, I mean, in India right now, there's this huge ruckus over entrance exams into the Indian Institutes of Technology, which were supposed to go online and didn't happen. And that's like, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids sit for these exams that's super competitive to get into these extremely elite institutions. And so I think the, the one silver lining that I think is emerging from this is that because assessment drives instruction and you know it's a backward sort of causation all through, that some of those things that are changing might lead to systemic change. And I think without our thinking of systemic change, of thinking of what are the sort of incentive structures that are built into these systems that make us behave in certain ways, um, I think we will still be sort of, um, appreciating and honoring and respecting individual innovators without necessarily seeing change happening at the kind of scale that we would like to see. Thank you, Punia. I, I, I would agree. I think that's uh, the, uh, the, the challenge, you know, I think later on we might talk a little bit about this. Do you actually see dramatic innovations being popping up out of necessity because of COVID? But let me actually get through the first line of questions to everybody, Kurt. You know, the last time that we had something like this, I think Punya wasn't here and I turned everything into a P word. And I got this article this past week or maybe a week and a half ago, I sent to all of you how, prof how the pandemic is pushing professors to improve their pedagogy. Now the pusher in the 60s and 70s wasn't a kind word to be called a pusher. But today the pandemic is pushing us. You know, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's causing us to reflect. And I'm, I'm reading a bunch of articles and I brought them up with me here. And reflection is happening at various levels. It's self-reflection. Christopher Reed has one of the articles and an encouraging report from Charlottesville. And he's reflecting on his son learning organic chemistry through Zoom in ways he hadn't imagined. He, the, He's finding that the meeting rooms and the polling and the hand raising is making it more interactive than he had thought it was going to be for his son. And his son is happy and he's happy. You know, so he's reflecting on his son. And then um, Christopher Schauberg wrote an article, Why I'm Teaching Online. He's at Loyola of New Orleans. And he just says it right out. He says, um, you know, I teaching online feels like the right thing to do in the moment. He didn't want to teach online, but it feels like the right thing to do in the moment. And we all can make it meaningful by learning from those who have been there doing it effectively for years. So there's something. People are reflecting on, hey, what can you teach me? What can you people, you guys that have been doing this, what can I learn from you? That wasn't necessarily the reaction we heard in the spring, but we're hearing that now. And we're, you know, the, the various pieces that are coming out are, are, are encouraging. You know, Ray Schroeder in Inside Higher Ed says, get, 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 get off of it, get real. You know, I teach computer science and, and hands-on stuff can be done virtually in, in computer science and in other disciplines. Some disciplines are harder than others. That was this past week on September 9th. Hands-on classes in distance and emerging, for, um, hands-on classes at a distance and the emerging virtual future that we all have. So well, several things come at me when I looked across, there's more articles. In our local paper, there was an article about a young girl in high school here who was gonna go to Moscow and go to the, the ballet, the Russian ballet. And she applied for um, a, a grant project to learn Russian online at home. And she's enjoying it tremendously because they're native Russian speakers, unlike her high school teachers who aren't native speakers and they're teaching her Italian and French and other things. And, uh, and so she's talking about the positives of this. And I'm seeing these positives come out. 
Then, so that was two days ago. And then the next day, there was an article about uh, a couple of guys that were in the middle school of sixth graders, and they're creating a um, kind of like a how-to, a spy detective agency to teach math in the local, and in, in, actually it's in the more rural part of Bloomington area. It's a little lower SES area. Uh, and the kids are getting so excited about hearing what the next episode's being. They're turning in all their homework really fast so they can get the next video of what's going to happen in the caper that, that these teachers are producing. It's phenomenal. And, that, and then yesterday, a local business, Solution Tree Publishing, which is a book publishing for K-12 um, here in Bloomington, they've offered office space to parents to, uh, whose kids are being homeschooled to bring them in. They have a side area and they're, they're hiring IU, uh, Indiana University students to proctor their online experiences and their exams. So I'm seeing, you know, and, and the parents are so happy. So I'm, there's these win-win situations and I don't like the expression. So I'm seeing a lot of how-tos. I'm seeing a lot of examples. I'm seeing a lot of re-examination of one's practices to move to essay-based and, you know, for, away from multiple guest kinds of things to student synthesizing across, um, and there's a couple other things, but anyways, the pedagogy is changing and people's mindsets are changing in this pandemic. And that's a hopeful sign. Uh, what I'm reading this week are hopeful signs. So I'll stop right. there. Uh, for summarizing, well, you look at changes and uh, let's actually go to China. Strong Ye, have you, um... What have you seen? What have you heard you know, from all these episodes and your life? Um, yeah, actually now um, everything in China is almost back to normal. See, this is uh, make me feel that uh, even during the pandemic, because uh, China is the first um, to experience the pandemic. And now we are almost in, um, almost in the, the, the later part, later period. So this is like the world and also China. Uh, when I um, participated in this program, I will see as a kind of continuum. Yeah, for like um, China and the world and also the different modes uh, in the world, like uh, uh, in Italy, in the Shanghai, you're on mute. You're on mute. So you just said Italy, and then we lost you. Start back. Oh, sorry. On. Yeah. Um, in uh, Italy, uh, India, and the different places that we can see how the world and the different systems, um, no matter large or small, they are making their efforts. Just like um, Kurt said, I read that uh, we can see quite a lot of how to choose examples and also the uh, mindsets is changing um, but however i will still have this kind of a reservation uh, for the future change that is um from unesco the um the the promoted learning to learn first and then learning to live together however um we were just uh, see people are more focused on this uh, learning and still be very um constrained by this imagination of our uh, school-based learning. Yeah, this is kind of, um, I don't know whether a tragedy or, but the, on the other side, we can see the value of schools like Apunia uh, has already published uh, his uh, commentary. But I would like to point out this as just uh, especially from the most popular uh, episode in our program that is about our interview with uh, for children, for students in our program that we can see how kids, uh, they can have their own um, incentives and uh, their own um, motivations to learn. And uh, we can still see uh, quite a lot of this, um, how do you say, um, the, the influence and the impact from their teachers. So even we cannot do in this uh, school mode or in this kind of collective mode of education, but uh, how can we still maintain or appreciate 
this student and teacher or student and other adults or student with other peers with this kind of a new type of relationship. That is, I think the kids um, in this generation, they have already taken this blended mode as kind of a natural option. Yeah, so how much can we really more focus on the children's or the students' perspectives? This, I think this um, maybe we can focus more because even in China, we still, um, but the, the current discussion is still more focusing on how the system are doing or how the system achieve something. Yeah, the system is important. However, we're still missing um, the students' voices. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's important, Sonia, to have your voice from China because China right now technically has resolved it. I don't know how why, when this comes back, if it comes back, what's going to happen. And that's still kept uh, watch, but thank you. Uh, Chris, you're the last to, uh, to reflect on this. What do you think we've learned? Well, I there's a couple different views about history. And one view about history is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And <clears throat> people who don't understand the past are doomed to repeat it and you know there there are discontinuities that come and go but history is a macro system and things tend to return to some kind of a normal that only slowly evolves and there's a lot of truth to that view of history but there's another view of history as well that says once in a while the discontinuity is so profound that it, it kind of knocks the macro system into a different state. <clears throat> and so after the First World War, followed by the global pandemic, the, the economic boom and bust, the Second World War, <clears throat> the world by historical standards was unrecognizable. Now, does that mean that human nature changed? No, not at all. Human nature never seems to change. And so that's kind of a constant through history. But how the strengths and the follies of human nature are expressed is different after one of these profound discontinuities that in a sense put, put us into an ahistorical period. Now, it's, it's always easy when you're in a discontinuity to say, oh, this is one of the big ones. This isn't a little one. This is one of the big ones. But in fact, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that this is one of the big ones. Um, the, the, the global economy has been so thoroughly disrupted and, and national economies have been so thir thoroughly trashed in at least the capitalist countries that that it's a whole different landscape for business. Uh, climate change <clears throat> is changing how we approach everything that's related to climate, which is an enormous amount of stuff. And it seems to be happening much sooner than we expected. And it does not seem to be reversible, even though at the moment, we're not doing a lot of the things that have been driving climate change forward. Um, medicine, not going to go back to where it was before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You pick all the sectors of society and the leaders in those sectors of society are kind of recognizing the discontinuity. I mean, I'm, I'm on an email list for McKinsey, one of the big consulting groups. And I get these emails that say that are for business leaders and they basically say, tear up the playbook you know, get ready for this new world. Think about how you're going to restabilize, but not in the old way to some new kind of a, a place. <clears throat> and I think that that's true of leaders in many of the other sectors. Not so in education, as usual. Um, there are bottom-up innovators who are doing wonderful things. 
<clears throat> and there are kind of middle out groups like this one and others that are trying to consolidate those things and, and get a voice and get a platform. But the vast majority of leaders in education, meaning leaders of the education bureaucracy as it exists now, are, are not operating from that. They're assuming that this is just one of the little historical discontinuities. <clears throat> and I, I find it really troubling. And I don't know what it's going to take to, um, to get us as a field to really accept that we, that we are at a, a point of reinvention and that it's profoundly to the disadvantage of this next generation of kids if we just pretend that somehow it's still 2019. So um, I find myself puzzled why, why education once again is, is the one part of society that really is steadily fixated on the rear view mirror from the top down. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, I have to tell you, um, just after listening to all of you and I'm thinking about back to say the various episodes we've had and also I'm sitting surrounded by wildfires which have never been so close to my home and just going through all of this is is what what's shocking is we call about what's the purpose of uh, uh, of education that's I really kept going back and also what another thing I think I've seen uh, from this episodes Whatever the, the great teachers are doing, rely on one person to do it. That's the students. I think was, uh, you know, so the, the students are, are very important. So what I've learned is that, um, is how do we motivate students and mobilize students? And, you know, with the, the, uh, Sean Ye was talking about the, force, the, the, the students we had. There are many more of them. And then that, of course, comes to the big issue. Our audience have always been concerned about so equity is that you know, the ones who have voices, like Kurt, you were talking about in your writing, the, pa the father can write about the child and learning this. And, but then those who don't have the voices, the parents who can choose to join the pod and those who don't get to join the pod. And the ones who can hire, you know, Kathleen Tucker, the ones who cannot hire her to, to, give, to give all those things. So actually I'm, I'm really just thinking about how the COVID and, we are lucky to have technology today compared to 1919, you know, compared to that many, many years ago. We have the technology uh, and I, I can't claim to know all technologies, but you know, now when I go through the websites of districts, they're all trying to give technology, give learning, remote learning packages to students in the US. And of course, when you read uh, um, the reports from UNESCO, you see students in Africa, in South America, in many other places have nothing. The basic thing have stopped. So I was just wondering about um, your thinking. You can be as wild as possible about when we end this in two years or three years, what's the global economy will be like? You are, you are being asked to be a global economist who has may have something to say about education because in developed countries, we may see more individual students rise above on their own. Then in the less developed countries, they basically shut them back without schooling. Anybody can jump in. You want to jump in with that? Punya? So um, that's a big question, Zhao, and I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just I hate to progress too far. Uh, I, let me just say a couple of uh, responses to you know what uh, Chris said, and I'm so glad that you brought up the issues of climate change and global equity and all and the changes in the economy because I mean at some level all these situations that we are facing now is in some fundamental way related to the failure of our profession to not smartly look forward. So that rear view mirror thing that you said, Chris, I mean, whether you look at climate change, I mean, the evidence for that has been around forever. If you look at this pandemic, 
I was not a person who was following epidemiology news, but when it first started, I was not surprised because you just had to live in the world and follow news to know that something like this in a global world <clears throat> is bound to happen at some point or the other, whether it came out of China or whether it came out of uh, Tanzania or India was not the point that in a global world of this nature that these kinds of infections can spread. But the manner in which we have responded to all of these speak deeply to our failure as a field. And if there's one thing that we have to fundamentally rethink is how we, what is the content of education and how we think about it. I think it's been for too long been learning, preparing students, <clears throat> taking 16 years to prepare they can go something. To starting that, that sort of, and I, and you know, uh, Zhao, you've talked about Greta Thunberg and then how can we have a million of them, right? And I think that to me is the biggest challenge. Punya, you are stuck. You might be disconnected. And uh, well, let's have someone else react to what Punya was saying. How do we have a minion, Greta Thunberg? Anyone else wants to jump into the big question? Well, I want to go back to Paul Kim. Um, I was very struck with the $35 box that um, if, if you've got some, any kind of mobile device that connect to a local network and you've got a $35 box, Raspberry Pi, lots and lots of memory, um, you go back to the old computer lab model, but what you put on it is not digitized worksheets and multimedia textbooks, it's, you know, how do you ask big questions? I think that's how we get the million Greta Thornburgs. And, and I think that ironically, it's easier to think about doing that in the global South countries that know that their educational system is broken and that are desperate to find something to salvage uh, the generations of kids then it's going to be in the global north countries where the entrenched educational systems are fighting tooth and nail against changing uh, where things are. So I, I think that we have, I think we have the answers, but we haven't had the courage to really tackle them at, at scale. And I'm going to go back to what Scott said. Scale is, is the biggest single problem. In, in education. And um, it, it, uh, you would have thought that the pandemic would have done it, but we're still teetering on the edge of just going back to where we were. And so how do we, how do we tip? How do we go over that edge? Well, you know, Punya, uh, I, I want to make sure you, you come back again because uh, I, I just want to latch onto the idea when Chris was talking. What can we as individuals do? You know, there are global companies that does tutoring, global companies do all of this various things with Paul Kim's $35 box or other things, you know, the, in the internet, Wi-Fi. I think the majority of people today could access to a lot of information than before. Could any one of us, for example, begin to run a, a global institute for students? Uh, in, in the summer, I have uh, been working with a bunch of people running something I call HIP Camp, the Human Inter uh, Interdependence Project. I started with that, and we had uh, just different schools that joined us to run this. We had uh, uh, schools from six different countries and kids, and they were joining and doing that. I was wondering, any one of us or any of our audience, they could, you know, I was thinking about, again, Katrin Tucker, could she be running what if she run a global, let's say, hybrid uh, curriculum institute to, for students directly? Because I have been getting very tired of uh, trying to improve teachers, improve schools, improve leaders. 
we have millions of kids passing through us very quickly. So how, how do we get to students and with today's technology? Uh, anyway, so Puni, I want to get back to you. Uh, you, you, yes. We lost you. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I, I uh, got bumped off. Uh, <clears throat> so again, I think this comes back to the whole issue of systems. Yes, you can reach the kids directly. The question is going to be, at some point, they have to apply to universities or some other institutions, or they have to go for jobs. It's the issue of certification. It's the issue of degrees. Those are the kind of systemic barriers, I think, that get in the way. You know, um, you can, I mean, yes, of course. I mean, those kids that we had on our show, they were amazing. But if everything happens outside of this educational structure, that's the challenge. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's going to be once you scale up, then the issue becomes who is going to recognize, I mean, all of these things, if you think about it, I mean, what a certificate is or a degree is, is an acknowledgement that, oh, we made you jump through a bunch of hoops. Here is a piece of paper to certify that you jumped through the hoops, right? That's at the end of the day, that's what it is. And the whole <laughs> system is built on these little pieces of paper, which certify that you have jumped through hoops, not whether you learned or didn't learn. So, so, right? yes, I, mean, so I think. <clears throat> Go ahead. No, no, I, I like I like the idea about jump through the hoops. That, that's what. So you, what we've learned so far from our 26, 25 episodes is actually if a person who has access to technology wants to learn, they can learn. That's what Kurt probably you've been arguing. And then is it time truly for this, for us or for parents to say, let's forget about this certification process. Let's organize different learning communities. That's not necessarily having to go to Stanford, Harvard, or Yale. Let's just go with our own, own certification. You know, I, I, I was looking at uh, Google, you know, the Google career certificates. They're trying to say, okay, do half a year, you got your own uh, certification, go get a job. So, so is that kind of things happening? Kurt, you were going to say something. Scott, go for it. Scott. Yeah, sure. Around the edges, slowly, right? And of course, that brings up equity concerns again, because the people who are going to have the foundation of safety to try a new model, right, to head towards a pandemic pod or a private certification or whatever, are going to be those who are affluent, right, who have the ability to absorb the hit if it doesn't work. Uh, we have millions and, you know, and millions of kids and families all around the world who are still relying on some basic foundational education in order to get a basic foundational job. And they don't have or feel they have the space to experiment with new learning modalities, credentialing modalities, and so on, right? So, you know, if my kid decided to skip college and go try one of these experimental pathways with Google, would he be fine down the road? Sure, because we could always send him to college later, right? But for other people, they don't have that luxury. You know, they have a certain time window in which to get their education. They have to go off and get to work. And um, we just haven't created, I think, those societal structures yet in which we're going to see folks beyond the affluent try things like Minerva, right? Try things like the Google Pathways, where they can absorb these sort of non-traditional credentialing spaces. Um, and so, you know, I've chosen to invest my efforts in the public schools, which is where we serve the majority of students and families, because they're the ones that need to slowly, gradually make the shift towards whatever the system needs to look like that meets the needs of a global innovation society, not an industrial society. And somebody's got to do that work for the vast majority of people who don't have the ability to experiment uh, with their lives and their careers in the ways that I think we're talking here. All right. Chris, Sean, yeah, and Kurt, you guys want to jump in? Yes. You know, every day we see millions of people who are disenfranchised with the way things are. And, and yet, there are so many initiatives in, in the education space that would help them. And we haven't found a way to take our ideas, our initiatives, our projects, our findings, and, and turn it into something that is 
in turn helpful on a mass scale as Chris and as Scott have pointed out. And so in effect, we're failing um, the people who need the support. We see the decisions that people make because they're not asking the right questions. They're failing to wear masks. They just assume they'll be okay. They're not analyzing data properly. They're not uh, you know, using critical thinking skills that can be taught through Paul Kim's system uh, you know, or, and others. Um, and so we have to find the means to not just provide solutions that the politicians are talking about, let's wipe off all the debt. Well, wiping off all the debt of people today, what's gonna to happen in two years when people have debt again? You know, that's not, it's not a long-term solution. It's just a temporary one. Of course, it frees up capital and gets people to reinvest in for the long-term, you know, but it, it isn't providing educational opportunities. It's providing financial opportunities. And I think there's a difference there. And so, you know, when Obama administration was talking about a national skills library, that's a, that's a stepping stone, providing open educational resources to get people to finish their high school degrees where they hadn't previously, or to ramp up the first year of college and second year of college for free through a national skills library. Um, you know, we, we have various things that do work at the hackathons. You know, there, there's people in Nepal who wrote a chapter in my recent book who are talking about high school kids, actually middle school girls and boys learning English to prepare them for college. And they're creating communities, which you guys are talking about creating communities around the learning of English and, and getting kids, not just in one school district, but then having those kids share it with the other school districts across Nepal and it's become a, a momentum that's happening across the whole country. And it's, and it's free, you know, there are, there are some things that are available that, and people are doing that are very impactful. And we have to find a way to showcase those things. So it's not just an argument about whether college should be free or not. You know, that's, it's an endless debate. It's not, it's not, gonna, op, it's not gonna create an education space for people. And um, you know, I, I just think there are so many healthy examples out there. We hear about them day after day um, with micro credentials and so forth, but I think we're stuck with an old system that isn't enabling us to quickly ramp up these nano degrees and micro credentials and whatever we want to call them to make them to help the unemployed auto worker um, uh, reskill and upskill and provide hope for all these people. And that's the only way to get them off the opium. Uh, pro, uh, solve the opium problem and 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 the pandemic problem is finding all these various solutions and 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 finding a way to make people aware of them. Just awareness is part. Now I've had an idea for 20 years to create, and you talk about global, to create um, the Institute for Globally Enhanced Thinking, Instruction, and Technology. The acronym is I Get It, um, and uh, I keep proposing it to my school of ed and I keep getting shot down, but um, uh, we'll talk about that offline. Um, but but what if you run yourself, Kurt? What do you just start on your own, in your little you know, house on your, on your deck? Yeah, I, you know, I have thought about that and that's probably gonna be what I, what I decide to do because my university isn't um, providing the support for that. Um, and it's a long story. I'll keep a smile on my face. <laughs> no, but, 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 but Kurt, uh, the, the reason I was uh, throwing that out at each one of us is that as we are getting old, uh, well, you, there are some, you guys are not as old as I am, maybe. So you are... there, no, no, there are a few things you want to do. I, I think affecting students directly at this time is just very important you know, working with teachers, with schools. So I've been very interested in any work, initiative, silver lining that can deliver direct impact to students. So that, that's when one of, so why don't you run your own institute? You know, you, you got the internet, you got the space, you can do it. I, I'm just thinking, that's just how, how the, the immediate COVID past would have to become 
So that's what, what I was interested in that, to think about how our students, when given the resources, not 100% will take them. So that's this another question. So, okay, how do you engage students? Engagement, students have to engage in very diverse set of curriculum, ideas, activities. So that's what I was uh, thinking about. Yeah, the Institute for Globally Enhancing Thinking, Instruction and Technology, it's on three things. Thinking skills, instructional strategies, pedagogy, and technology, you know, and so uh, you, pushing us to think, pushing us to think in new ways and, and interact and globally connect with others. You got to run uh, so, on your own. What's that? Strong Ye, do you have any, I see you have to run on your own. You become, I get it. Strong Ye, you want anything to comment on? Oh. You got it, you got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, now in China, there are quite a lot of um, people, they are running their own educational um, port. Yeah, once if they think of anything that I, they are good at, or they are, they also can think that, okay, I got um, uh, expertise. Now there is a APP or kind of a, a startup like uh, this is what, what you can get. This is also like, um, uh, this uh, education, they, they, they would like to promote that everyone could educate others. Yeah, so we have this kind of ideas and also initiatives coming out. But however, um, a good point from Professor uh, Yong, that is, um, if I can run something like that, I, I thought about that, but uh, later on dropped it. <laughs> This is what I, I think this is two things. One is uh, if we think about um, COVID-19 past, um, the, the future of the uh, pandemic, this is uh, the first, uh, how much we can really escape from the institution. The certification is not only about uh, the paper, this is a paper of diploma, but it's also about a, that whole institution that people have to rely on some information. They have to trust something. So will they really could trust um, your record online or your learning record there, or they still like to have a, some external or kind of institutionalized um, endorsement about this. So this is kind of also this is a social um, this is a trust. This is how much really we can trust a, a kind of a message from the um, internet and or your past learning record. And the second is about this: um, if we, uh, how much we um, we, we really um, do? Do we have a real uh, undervalued or underestimated this uh, importance of a? attention deficit age. Now we have people who are really are easy to be uh, distracted from many things. But however, this is what I can see from the China, the, the students would like to go to school because they feel happy to be with uh, their peers in a kind of more collective community and the physical collective uh, uh, community in the classroom with their teachers, with their peers. So this would uh, make their selves less distracted from the internet or everything that you would feel interested online. You can just instantly Google it or just, you can search for it or attract it in, uh, into that. So I think this uh, maybe for this kind of a traditional schooling system uh, versus this uh, future more personalized learning depending on this internet sources, we have to um, reconsider this um, uh, the attention deficit or distraction um, behind that. Yeah. Thanks, Sonia. Scott, uh, you, you got something to jump back on, please. Yeah, so listening to you and Kurt and Shang Ye, I was reminded of a book from a decade ago called The Power of Pull. I think some of you probably read this book uh, back in the day from uh, Hegel, Sealy Brown, and Davison. I'll put a drop the link into the YouTube chat. Um, but wait a minute, Scott. Wait a minute. Back in the day, it feels like a recent book. Come on now. God, you're making me feel old. Back in the day, 10 years ago, man. 
Um, but one of the powerful ideas that I got from that book was this idea that uh, in every organization, frontline employees are now nodes connecting to other frontline employees and other organizations who are also nodes, right? And so instead of knowledge being distributed from the center out to the frontline employees, now as a teacher in a school building, for example, I can connect with a teacher in China who's doing interesting things and learn from her and try to bring those ideas back into my organization. And it's that idea of the power of pull, the idea that I saw something really interesting or cool somewhere else and I wanna make that happen for my class, my kids, my community that really resonated with me. But, and I think for those of us who are on the screen right now, this is the way that we have operated primarily in our careers is that we have tried to put interesting ideas and technologies and learning modalities in front of others, hoping that they will catch fire and pull people toward them and thus change education. But I think what we have not done, all of us plus many more of us, right, is that we haven't paid enough attention to the soil in which those seeds are planted. Right? And it does no good to have a bunch of awesome magic beans that will grow if you try to plant them in concrete. Um, and so I think, you know, going back to the systems idea that I mentioned at the beginning, is that the power of pull is not enough if we try to, or we're trying to embed them in systems that are not ready for those ideas or modalities. And so I would encourage all of us to continue to think about the systems in which we're trying to pull these ideas into and how do we make those systems more receptive beyond the early adopters and the innovators. So um, Scott, you know, I was um, really taken by that is, uh, is the, the connection, the nodes. Because I've been um, seeing right now, people are connecting, I think because of COVID, people are connecting beyond who they are right now. This is, is quite quite shocking. That, that's something really nice, beyond. And we are actually tracking different things, di different ideas. So I was actually quite curious. This is a goes to uh, Chris Punia. You know, I, I really want to bring your thoughts in here is that are you seeing new learning organizations that's going to be thrive very well in various different ways i've seen a number like some of them trying to do more online schools but very project-based they're recruiting students from different places do you think you're going to see bigger different learning things that might get into our public school system i'm only talking about the us right now punia and chris new learning organization that might use technology that's going to challenge our public school systems? Well, I talk to my students about three different models of change, evolution, transformation, and disruption. And disruption, as I get older, looks increasingly attractive to me because I'm burned out on battering my head against the stone wall of evolution and going through the bloody wars of transformation. Um, and, and we saw, I think, the potential power of disruption in that episode with the students and in the other students that I've met, some from elite institutions, some from public institutions with standard budgets that are just knock your socks off in terms of what they, they know and can do for their age. But disruption in addition to, to a model that's disruptive, it requires a kind of face validity. So in, in 78, uh, small computers were going nowhere. And, and some guys in business school came up with the idea of the spreadsheet and the professor made fun of them. And two years later, the spreadsheet was the killer app that blew open the small computer market and that completely changed the field of, of economics and accounting because you could ask what if questions in a way that, that had never been as easy before. And that just changed everything. We don't have a demonstration like that in education. What do we have? We have the spelling bee, you know, how well can you remember the spelling of words? Talk about you know a, a useless metric. We have quiz shows of different kinds. 
we have, did you do well enough on the high stakes tests to get into an elite school, which is actually a variation of the spelling bee in the quiz show, just with a little more dressing on it. And, and what we don't have and celebrate is something like that episode with the kids where we said to them, you know, how, how do you think about these really tough global challenges? And, and they were great. And, and so to get the disruptive models to disrupt, that we need venues in which the products of that in the short term for kids just blow people away. And they say, I want my kid. I want that for my kid. How do I get it? Sell me one of those spreadsheets. So I, I think that that's a missing piece that we need to think about. Well, the killer app, right? You're thinking about the killer app. That's what that's going to come. I'm up. thinking about the fact that we know how to produce the kids, not at scale, but we know how to produce them small scale. But we don't know how to demonstrate at scale that we can do that with kids and that we could scale it if we were given the opportunity and the old system would, would step back. Punya. So, um, one of the things, Chris, I was thinking of, I, I love the, the way you started it with this, you know, learning from history and, you know, the, the nature of history and it's either it's a cyclic nature or do we have these moments of punctuated equilibrium, which, you know, Scott mentioned on the chat that there are these points where there is a disjunction and there is significant change. And I think this connects back to sort of the point you just made now, which is this idea of disruption. And one of the things that I was, I was listening to some podcast about the impact of uh, natural disasters on sort of, you know, local, uh, on, on certain places and sort of the long-term impact of it. And one of the things that emerged from that was that there are underlying trends that were already happening and the natural disasters just sort of push it over the edge in some way. And I think that, that COVID-19 might be one of those which sort of pushes it over the edge in terms of education in certain ways. That said, I also think about certain disruptive innovations that have emerged within our last, within our lifetime in a few years, um, whether you look at social media or whether you look at the gig economy, which had incredible sort of negative effects on the lives of people. I mean, the, the Uber and the Lyft and the promise that you know anybody could work on the side, but the economic imperative of reporting to your stockholders of doing, you know, that's, that structure completely undermined any positive value that those organizations could bring. And I think that's something that we have to sort of think about because these, and, and, and Chang was absolutely right in saying that, you know, the certification is not just a piece of paper. It is a credential within this larger organizational system. And the incentives of those are fundamentally perverse. They are not fundamentally about what Zhao is trying to say, which is that how do we get to the individual learner? I mean, this whole infrastructure, if you take it all away, at the end of the day is a group of learners, right? But the, in, the broader institutional structures that are there are not geared towards the learner, even though, I mean, that's, the, I think what Scott spoke about sort of why he works in this public education space. And, and that's sort of a significant commitment for me as well, is because that's the only sort of a large scale system that we have, which has a vision of reaching every student is deeply committed to that. And that is the foundation of our democracy. And, and to me that if disruption has to happen, it has to happen at this broader incentive structures that have been built. I mean, uh, I, I, can, I was on Twitter just a little while ago and looking at the students who have been posting on Twitter, they have these, uh, they are being tested online and there are these companies which monitor your eye movement and then the professors have been sending this really nasty messages to students saying, we noticed that you had so many eye movements and so on, so you get zero on the test. Or that you didn't scan the room entirely, 
before you started the test, like what was behind the sofa, so you're going to fail this exam. And I think that we also need to be cognizant of that when disruptions happen, such as COVID-19, that it's not always necessarily that there will be positive effects of that, that there are also forces and big data or whatever you want to call it is also one of those forces which is emergent, which can become more powerful than anything else that we might be wanting and hoping. And I, I think that's, you know, I don't, you know, so that's been something that I've been thinking really hard about is, yes, this is a disruption. Uh, but the, the, the forces of whether you call it sort of the conservative nature of organizations and systems um, or other sort of incentive structures that are built in, how, can, how do they undermine these uh, other more positive elements of things that we are trying to do or people who are trying things which are innovative and, and we have those models of them, I get that. Uh, but I think unless we start talking at that level, um, we really won't see much happening or we will see very perverse uh, responses emerge. I mean, these are good universities I'm talking about. I'm not talking about some little silly online whatever. I mean, this is, I'm not naming the universities here, uh, but you just have to go on Twitter and see how terrible the pedagogy is that is emerging from COVID-19 as well, right? Well, Punia, uh, I, I want to just throw out one thing. I know we're almost time, but I want to put out connecting what you said. I want us to ponder, I want to invite audience to think about this. Because schools technically serve students in two ways. One is to serve them to become competent in the future but also schools serve them for 13 years, 12 years. So they have to have a, a life in that sense. And then that, that's one thing just to consider about that. Then we know education is the growth of the individual. It's not only about instruction. So what you described, what you described as eye movement in China, they had this, the head band, you know, trying to track your head, you know, this, so in many ways, do you feel like educational science or learning sciences, at least has been practiced by some people, are tremendously encroaching to privacy individuals? Or maybe are we too mature in trying to define every moment for our students? Maybe our system is so mature that everybody learned so well to control, manage every minute and they report the minute of the, the time. So students do not really have the time to grow up, to learn as human beings anymore. Yes, it's, they've been controlled by that. I saw that Kurt, you are you were gonna say something about that? Well, we might wanna have a show where we have some experts on machine learning come in and you know there are there are different paths to this. You know, the Bill Gates approach that you know we know what we know and we can lay out the path for all students, you know, and clarify uh, the, uh, the old behavioral model. And then there's another model for personalizing learning that's much different. And it might be interesting for us, uh, you know, to, to lay out what the different- Well, if you can is. find someone who represent the code of personalized learning group, a company is like, I would like to challenge them because I've been using the term very differently in, in China. I would like to have a good discussion about that. I think about, the idea when learning sciences become so good science to track student behavior, emotions all the time, how healthy is that as education? Yeah. All right. Chris, you have a final moment before we bring you strong year in to introduce our next next episode. Uh, Chris, you want to have final word? Nope, I want Song Ye to go for it. Okay. Song Ye, you are here. Okay, um, yeah, we are very happy to invite uh, three persons uh, from uh, comparative pers perspective to uh, introduce or not share their pers pers perceptions and also their um, observations between China and the world uh, during the pandemic and also in this uh, period when China, um, we have almost every school's uh, opening and uh, 
students can go back to the normal life. And uh, it's also amazing. There is a no single case of uh, COVID-19 from a teacher or student in our educational system. So this time, uh, next week, we will have a, um, Professor uh, Tuan Wang uh, from the Macau University, Dean of School of Education uh, at the University of Macau. Uh, he will provide scholarly pers uh, perspective, uh, especially between um, this um, Macau and the world, because Macau is also amazing uh, small educational system in China that is uh, uh, the education system went smoothly during the pandemic. And I also we invited two others out of the academic. One is Cody Abbey, the project manager at the Rural Education Action Pro Program. He used to work as a Sanxi, but now uh, because of the pandemic, he stayed at the university, uh, stayed in the United States uh, in America, and he were. But the, he still uh, worked closely with his partners there, and their project mainly uh, served those uh, rural teachers and the rural students in China. And also we have Ou Yangbing and the CEO of Lingming Education. In this group, at this. Uh, uh, Lingmin Education is the provider of teacher training in China, but uh, this is not uh, based uh, at the university. We would say this is kind of uh, uh, the third sector provider. Now, their, uh, his team is providing teacher education, uh, teacher training for uh, Jack Ma's foundation the, uh, of the rural education and the principles. So, uh, uh, but uh, he stayed in New York and uh, he has this kind of comparative perspec uh, perspective between this, uh, his observation of how on the district level, the, uh, edu uh, the China's education system and the New York education system are running. So I think the next episode will be a more uh, comparative in nature. Yeah, thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Shangye. Thank you, everybody. That's been a very good discussion today. Mm -hmm.